this other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vain, glorious loot. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He, too, has resigned his part. In the casual comedy, he, too, has been changed, in his turn transformed, utterly, a terrible beauty inborn. Extract from Easter 1916 by W.B. Yeats This was John McBride, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. Born in Westport, County Mayo, Ireland on the 7th of May 1868 to Patrick McBride and Henoria Gill. John was educated at CBS or the Christian Brothers School and then at St Malachy's College. John or Jack to friends had traditional red Irish hair with porcelain white skin and a long nose, which had him co-landed with the nickname Foxy Jack. John worked in a drapery shop in Roscommon and he studied medicine for a time but gave that up to start a job as a chemist in a firm in Dublin. While here he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood and was connected to the Gaelic Athletic Association or GAA founder Michael Cusack in its early days. John went on to join the Celtic Literary Society and made friends with Arthur Griffin the guy who founded the political party Sinn Féin. They remained friends and Arthur influenced John throughout his life. 1893, the British government would state John McBride as a dangerous nationalist. In 1896, on behalf of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, John went to the US and he came back the same year and then emigrated to South Africa. McBride would take part in the Second Boer War on the Boer side in the Irish Transvaal Brigade, a two Irish command volunteer military units of guerrilla militia. It would become known as McBride's Brigade and was the first commanded by an Irish American, Colonel John Blake, who was an ex US cavalry officer. McBride was the one to choose Blake as commander because McBride had literally zero military experience. The brigade would be given full official recognition by the Boer government and the brigade's officers were commissioned and signed by State Secretary Francis William Wrights. McBride was commissioned with the high rank of major and he got Boer citizenship. 500 Irish and Irish Americans fought with the Boers against the British. These Irish commandos would come up against the Irish regiments like the Royal Dublin Fusilers, which was an Irish infantry re regiment of the British Army since 1881, and the Royal Inniskillen Fusilers, another Irish line infantry of the British Army. From the green hills of Ladysmith to the plains of the Orange Free State, McBride's Brigade took action. Their first job was to protect the French seize gun, Borer's Long Tom, and then the brigade went on to fight in the Battle of Colinesso, which was the third and final fight in the Black Week of the Second Boer War. Later they harassed Lord Robert's cavalry from the rear as the Boer army retreated. A second Irish brigade would be set up by Arthur Lynch. An ambulance corp of Irish Americans would arrive at the Irish camp and strengthen McBride's brigade. Michael Davitt, an Irish Republican for many causes, resigned as MP or Member of Parliament in England. He would come and visit and support McBride's brigade. When Colonel Blake was injured, it was up to McBride to be the commander of the brigade. Blake did return but only for a while and later he left to join another commando. Back in Ireland, it was very much pro-Boer. Arthur Griffin and a lady named Maud Goon, was a, who was an English-Irish Republican, revolutionary, suffragette and actress. The pair were kept up to date with the war and they formed the most popular and passionate of the European pro-Boer movements. However, over 16,000 Irish fought for the British in the Boer War. So McBride became a citizen of Transvaal, the British said, as an Irishman and British subject of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, he had given aid to the enemy, so they claimed. 
When the war finished, McBride went to Paris, where he met Maud Gunn, who was living there at the time. They would get to know one another and married in 1903. Their marriage wasn't approved by many, including by poet W.B. Yeats. He really liked Maud, like really, really liked Maud, and he thought of her as his muse and he had once even proposed to her. A year after John and Maud married, they had a son that they named Sean. Sean McBride would go on to be an Irish clan and public politician who founded and took part in various international organisations like the UN, Council of Europe and Amnesty International. Sean would also receive the Nobel Peace Prize and Lenin Peace Prize. So back to his father John's life. So he's married Maud and had Sean and poet W.B. Yeats isn't happy about any of this. In January 1905, Yeats writes to a Lady Gregory. That same month, John and Maud go separate ways. In his writings to Lady Gregory, Yeats claims he was told McBride had molested his stepdaughter, Isolut, who was the only 10 at the time, and this was the reason for the split. With the marriage over, the question of who got custody of Sean couldn't be agreed upon. Maud was the one to start proceedings in Paris, but her request for a divorce was never given. Maud did get custody of Sean until he was 12. McBride got visiting rights and one month each summer, but McBride went back to Dublin and never saw Sean again. Forty years after the marriage collapse, Maud blamed McBride's loneliness and drinking problems. Maud would say, quote, We had a house in Passy and John worked as secretary to Victor Collins, who earned a larger salary as correspondent to the New York Sun and Laffins Borough, a fairly important news agency in New York. Despite my warning, John became the inseparable companion of Collins, who introduced him to a rather undesirable drinking set, who usually foregathered in the American bar. He had an unhappy life in Paris. He did not know, he did not know a word of French and must most often have been very lonely as my work kept me much in Ireland." End quote. Once John returned to Dublin permanently in 1905, he joined other nationalists in preparing for an insur insurrection. Because the British knew McBride, the leaders thought it best not to have him involved in secret military meetings about the Rising. Because of this, McBride found himself smack in the middle of the Rising with no prior warning or knowledge. He was in Dublin early morning on Easter Monday 1916 to meet Dr. Anthony McBride, his brother. He was coming from West Porter Mayo to be married on the Wednesday. The mayor was walking up Grafton Street when he seen Thomas McDonough, an Irish political activist, poet, playwright, educationist and revolutionary leader. He was in full military uniform leading troops through the streets. McBride seen them and offered his service and he was immediately given second in command at the Jacobs factory. With much greater numbers and heavier weapons, the British army suppressed the rising. An unconditional surrender happened Saturday 29th of April 1916. After this, many rebels were arrested. John McBride was court-martialed under the defence of the Realm Act and he was executed by firing squad in Dublin's Comenum Goal on May 15, 1916. Facing the British pointing guns at him, McBride called out not to be blindfolded. He said, quote, I have looked down the muzzles of too many guns in the South African war to fear death, and now please carry out your sentence, end quote. With that said, the guns rose, clicked and fired. John McBride is buried in a cemetery at Arbor Hills Prison in Dublin. And that is the story of John McBride. Like and subscribe on my YouTube and podcast and join me next time for the two-part story of Rwanda genocide. Happening April 7th to July 15th, 1994, during the Rwanda Civil War. 
In the period of a hundred days, members of the Tutsi minority and the moderate Hutu and Twa were killed by armed militaries. It's believed 500 to 650,000 Tutsis were killed alone. The scale and brutality of the genocide caused shockwaves worldwide, but no country intervened to forcefully stop the killings. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil. <laughs>